Namaste and hello. I am delighted to welcome you to today's event centered around an important and timely topic, China's rise and its implication for global freedom with Dr. Larry David Diamond. This event is organized and presented by NICE, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, a leading think tank that is committed to fostering intellectual discourse and promoting peace worldwide. I am Manasvi Bantua, a researcher here at NICE, and it is my privilege to initiate today's webinar. At NICE, our core values revolve around the principles of freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We tirelessly strive to expand and simplify the complexities of our world to advance peace, be it through academic research, scholarly articles, events, or webinars, such as the one that we are embarking upon today. Today's webinar is moderated by Dr. Pramo Jaiswal, the Research Director at Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. He is a visiting fellow at Sandia National Laboratories, Cooperative Monitoring Center at Albuquerque, New Mexico in the United States, a senior fellow at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies in New Delhi, and a researcher at South Asian Studies Institute for Asian Studies at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. He has been a regular and visiting faculty at different university in Nepal and China. Previously, he has worked with Manakor Badikar Institute for Defense Studies um, and as a Delhi correspondent with Rising Nepal. He is a member of the editorial board and the journal um, for the Journal of International Affairs, Kathmandu, a member of the academic committee at the Bungal Institute in Beijing, and a member of the International Advisory Committee of the Journal of Liberty and International Affairs, Macedonia, and the editor of chief of Journal of Security and International Studies, and a member of subject committee of International Relations and Diplomacy at Thiruvan University. He holds a master's and Phil and a PhD from um, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He is also the recipient of the Silver Jubilee Scholarship and SARC Doctoral Fellowship from the Indian Council for Cultural Relations from the Government of India. As we embark on this insightful discussion, I'm honored to be passing the mic on to our research director, Dr. Jaswal, who will be introducing our distinguished guest today, Dr. Larry Diamond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mansri. Professor Larry Diamond and dear participants, a very warm well welcome to our special session on China's rise and its implication for global freedom. As Mansri mentioned, NICE is an independent think tank that believes in freedom and democracy and world free from conflict. We often organize discussions and debates on Southeastern democracies. To talk on today's interesting topic, we have very distinguished speaker who needs no introduction. But please let me introduce, already introduce Professor Derry Diamond. Professor Derry Diamond is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Mass Becker Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at the Freeman Sporting Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He also chairs the Hoover Institution Project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region and is the principal investigator of the Global Digital Policy Incubator, part of Stanford's Cyber Policy Center. Uh, for more than six years, he directed FSI's Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. During 2017 and 2018, he co-chaired the Orville Cell, a working group formed of researchers from Hoover and from Asian Society Center of U.S.-China Relations, culminating in the report China's Influence and American Interest, Promoting Constructive Vigilance, published by Hoover Institution Press in 2019. He is the co-founding co-editor of the Journal of Democracy and also serves as senior consultant at the International Forum for Democratic Studies of the National Endowment for Democracy. He has served as a consultant at different organizations, including USAID, and has also served and advised and lectured to universities and think tanks around the world and to the World Bank, the United Nations, the State Department, and other governmental and non-government agencies dealing with governance and development. He has edited and co-edited some 50 books on democratic development around the world, which includes Search for Democracy in 2016, The Spirit of Democracy in 2008, Developing Democracy Towards Consolidation in 1999, Promoting Democracy in 1990s, published in 1995, and the Class, Ethnicity and Democracy in Nigeria, published in 1989. He received all his degree from Stanford University, and he has taught sociology at Vanderbilt University from 1980 to 1985. Professor Larry, uh, please make your remarks in about 25 to 30 minutes, which will be followed by questions and answers. The program is streaming live in several social media pages. 
We'd like to request our participants to drop their questions on Zoom chat or on the Facebook Live. You can also tweet or WhatsApp the question if you like. Professor Lai, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jaiswal. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Manasvi Bantawa. Uh, just remind me how long you want me to present before we go to Q&A. Maybe 25 minutes, sir. Okay. So hopefully I can share a screen and get to my presentation. Let me uh, start from the top. Okay. Um, can you see this? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, let's think about China's rise, uh, what it means for the world, what it means for countries like Nepal. You're one of many countries that has a significant uh, border with the People's Republic of China. So this is uh, relevant, I think, for all the countries of Asia and maybe the world, but maybe a little more relevant for Nepal than for a number of other countries. Um, I think we uh, need to understand what the political system of the People's Republic of China is and how it has been evolving. And um, the, there are some uh, uncomfortable points that need to be acknowledged. One is that this is what I would call a neo-totalitarian state. Uh, and you'll see why as I go through my slides. It's obsessed with control, political control, ideological control, social control, and certainly and increasingly as an instrument of those technological control. Um, and the reason why is that, that it is obsessed with control is that it is a communist party state uh, in which, as I'll uh, emphasize in a moment, uh, the overriding first goal is to preserve the monopoly on power, the he absolute hegemony of uh, the Chinese Communist Party, and nothing can be allowed that would challenge that. And because China <clears throat> is also modernizing, it's become a much wealthier country, more socially complex, people are traveling more, they're getting more education. With education comes more inquiring minds, more desire for questioning for pluralism, for choice, for voice. Uh, the regime has had to tighten down in order to avoid potential challenges to its rule that would come with modernization. And a communist party state, particularly the Chinese one, uh, it has a vast united front apparatus uh, that's meant to engage, but really penetrate and co-opt actors in other countries through the use of what we now call sharp power. And I'm going to uh, explain what that is. We had a lot of hopes. I, I think they were not unreasonable hopes. They were worth pursuing uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago that as China modernized uh, and was drawn into the world, into the World Trade Organization and so on, it would become a more open society. And um, if not a democracy, you know, at least it might gravitate toward um, being more pluralistic, open and less repressive in the way that Singapore has done and been. But those hopes have not been realized. China's not emerged in the world as what uh, our former deputy, deputy Secretary of State Robert Zella called a responsible stakeholder in world affairs. That was the hope. The reality is what you see in terms of building military bases in the South China Sea, the uh, provocation of neighbors, particularly India, you can tell me whether you're having problems on your own border. 
and the constant bullying and pressure on other countries, whether it's Vietnam, the Philippines, certainly Taiwan, and so on. China is a superpower. It is a peer competitor now, or sometimes we call it a near peer competitor of the United States, but the two most powerful countries are China and the US. But um, China increasingly seeks to project its global power and inf influence through something, a means we call sharp power, power that is covert, coercive, and corrupting. China has crushed freedom in Hong Kong, and it's engaged in a very rapid military buildup, which I think has the goal of completely pushing the US out of Asia to kind of clear the way for PRC hegemony and ultimately trying to conquer one of the most uh, vibrant democracies of the third wave, namely Taiwan. Those are my summary points. I may not be able to elaborate them all, Let's see how far I can, how far I can get. So uh, one trend we need to be mindful of is that things have gotten a lot worse under Xi Jinping. Uh, he has, of course, personalized power and undermined a variety of institutions that were meant to check and constrain the power of a Chinese ruler, in part by limiting them to two terms in power. He's now started his third term as president. And uh, under Xi, but this has been going on for a while, um, China has been building a really, in its scope and comprehensiveness, I think terrifying uh, Orwellian surveillance state. Uh, this state uh, seeks to um, uh, watch what everyone is doing. It's using facial recognition all over the country, big data processing, uh, increase, it's monitoring people's social media posts on things like WeChat and Weibo. It's physically tracking people. It's digitally tracking people. It now has a, um, uh, a digital currency, as I'll explain, that enables them to do that better. It's detained, the estimate is up to 1 million Uyghurs in re-education camps in Xinjiang. And it's increasingly seeking to extract uh, and take command of all the data of individuals and all of the data of corporations, including all, of course, the social media corporations, in, in part to monitor what people are doing and in part to train its artificial intelligence. Um, part of the goal uh, is to have a system of social control that will be so comprehensive, uh, what's called the social credit system uh, that you see here. Um, someone is waiting in the waiting room, just letting my colleagues know. Um, uh, to have a system of social control that's so um, comprehensive that the party state will know everything that people do, write, say, where they travel. And if you are saying things, posting things, uh, doing things, whispering things that are disloyal to the Chinese Communist Party or to its system of rule, then uh, you know you might get a you will get a low social credit score, and if you have a so low social credit score and <clears throat> the Communist Party state thinks you can't be trusted, <clears throat> they can punish you by denying you access to social services, denying you a passport or the ability to book a plane trip abroad. Um, punishing your children by making sure they don't get admitted to schools. If you look at how comprehensive this can be, you can see how intimidating it can be and how much fear it will strike in people that they better not say or do or hint at anything that would betray disloyalty to the Chinese Communist Party, even though a growing number of people are upset about the party and the way it's governed. 
and the encroachments on their freedom. Um, this uh, represents a couple of photographs of uh, Xinjiang province, where, as you know, um, mosques have been defaced and torn down. Um, up to a million Uyghurs have been held in political re-education camps. I don't know what the number is now, where they're brainwashed or there is an attempt to brainwash them or at least terrorize them into abandoning their Muslim faith and uh, you know, just submitting to the party state. In the last two, three years, China has been rapidly pursuing a digital currency. Uh, there really is no paper money anymore in China or very little use of it. Um, you basically pay electronically using the digital yuan. And you can see here, you have a mobile phone, you get what's called an e-wallet. Uh, so it's no more a physical wallet with paper, paper money in it. And with this, um, you can make payments for anything you purchase. You can send money, uh, you can receive money and so on and so forth. Why should we worry about that? Well, on the one hand, great for China, it's going to make the economy more efficient. It, it speeds up financial transactions, greatly eats, eases payments, um, loans, uh, all kinds of movements of money. But this is a central bank digital currency. So again, everything that someone does uh, commercially or financially now is going to be able to be monitored by the Chinese Communist Party state, which of course controls the central bank. Uh, and, uh, or at least it will leave a digital trail that can be stored and investigated later. So on the one hand, yeah, good, it can reduce financial crime. But on the other hand, if you have a state that's already a neo-totalitarian state, and now they have this ability to uh, track and monitor every, everything that someone buys, every financial movement and transaction they make, it's a huge loss of individual privacy and a huge enhancement of state capacity and control, including the ability to stop transactions or the ability to punish people for transactions. Um, the state can now uh, have a new means to spy, not just on individuals, but on corporations, their finances, their strategies, their relationships with one another. It might in the long run challenge the primacy of the dollar, of the US dollar in international commerce. I mean, if that happens through honest competition, um, you know, uh, that is the burden on us to be more competitive. But if it happens through coercion and intimidation and loss of individual freedom, that's a more alarming story. So um, alarming, I think, to you as well, should be China's rise to superpower status, given the way it's using that power. As you know, China is now the world's second largest economy. In the next 15 years, it could well become the world's largest. It's the biggest source of trade and aid for large portions of the world. It has the world's most rapidly expanding military, second only to the US in power and scope. More alarmingly, it's, it's really seeking control of the South China Sea, of global supply chains, of Taiwan, particularly in the maritime space, it's become an increasingly aggressive power. And you know you can do your own assessment of what this means for your land border. I have a little bit of idea of what um, my friends in India feel about the security of their land border. And as you probably know, they're pretty concerned. China's a near competitor now in the artificial intelligence race. 
um, again, fine uh, in global economic competition. Let's have a you know race to the swiftest and most innovative. But the problem is that China doesn't only want to use artificial intelligence for commercial purposes, for economic development and enhancement, improvement in he human health and so on. It's plowing AI into the modernization of its military at a very frightening pace. And I think the Chinese goal is to become a hegemonic power throughout Asia and ultimately the world. Uh, and that is very alarming uh, for the other countries of East, Southeast, and South Asia. What are the goals of the Chinese Communist Party? I think they can be summarized in this way. I've already said, first, the survival of Chinese Communist Party rule. And to do that, they need control. And I think the lesson they have drawn, and they've studied it very closely, the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, and Gorbachev's um, political and economic opening. The lesson they've drawn from that experience is don't open at all. Don't allow any freedom or pluralism or loosening of control, or you might wind up like Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. So they are seeking to deepen, modernize, uh, and extend the party control of people, of organizations, of information, of resources, of technology, and of course, of their population abroad, as I'll explain, and of other countries. Part of this is to control the narrative about China, not only within China, that's fairly easy to do, but abroad in other nations. Uh, they have a kind of make China great again ideology to rejuvenate the Chinese nation. They think that reunifying Taiwan with the motherland is essential for that. That's pretty scary if you are Taiwan with its open society and democracy because the people of Taiwan don't want to join a neo-totalitarian state. I think it'd be different if, if mainland China were a democracy and Taiwan could say, okay, you know, we can be somewhat autonomous under a democratic constitution and so on. But to join this uh, would mean to have freedom crushed in the way it has been in Hong Kong. And even worse, because Hong Kong was never, you know, autonomous. It's still it had its elections, it's had its media freedom, but still under one country, two systems. Now the party has shown uh, that one country, two systems is an illusion. So I think China's think seeking regional dominance, uh, eventually global dominance, um, and that means military, geopolitical, financial, and economic dominance. It would rather, win without fighting if you're smart you know who wants to go to war it's better to have people it's better to threaten people intimidate people penetrate their institutions engage in psychological warfare and intimidation and then have them bend on knee and say well okay we don't want to go to war uh what do you want how do we resolve this and then you become a vassal state or an appendage of, of the hegemon. It's very important to understand how the Chinese think, uh, the PRC. Um, they do study the great Chinese uh, uh, philosopher, scholar of war, Sun Tzu, who wrote the book, The Art of War. And, um, you know, his argument is the best way to do this is to break the enemy's resistance without fighting. But if you can't do that, <laughs> then you fight. Um, Deng Xiaoping had a very famous phrase um, as he sought to end the Maoist nightmare and modernize and build up China. And it wasn't his words, it's a kind of ancient aphorism dating back through uh, probably many emperors. 
uh, and it is the phrase, hide your strength, bide your time. The idea was, you know, China should not be impatient. It shouldn't seem to be seeking what it has been seeking um, for decades, which is, um, you know, regional and ultimately, I think, global hegemony. But, you know, just kind of do it quietly, build up the economy, build up the military. And you only kind of reveal your intentions when you're absolutely certain that you can compel others to uh, submit to your demands. This was leading to a very gradual rise until Xi Jinping came to power. And then he abandoned this, uh, this philosophy of global rise and substituted what was called wolf warrior diplomacy. Now they're backing away a little bit from it but there's still a rising pace of geopolitical uh, and military intimidation and domination in the region and growing as you see, even after Secretary Blinken's visit to China, growing tension with the US. Um, how does Beijing want to achieve its dominance? Uh, it does so by, I'll come back to this, controlling their narrative about China Again, not only within the PRC, but globally. Um, and that means it has to suppress any information or any organization that's critical of China, easy to do within the borders of the PRC as a, a neo-totalitarian party state, harder to do so with other countries around the world. Therefore, <clears throat> it has set upon a strategy of united front activity and global propaganda and um, agents abroad around the world to penetrate and sway the institutions of other countries, their newspapers, their TV stations and other media flows, their think tanks, universities, corporations, research institutes, their politics at the local level, politics and government at the national level, and build these friendly ties, um, which are also censoring ties, because their view is you can't be a friend if you're criticizing China. Uh, and uh, then the other elements of this are to acquire from us, from Europe, from Taiwan, from Korea, from Japan, uh, leading technology, extract it or steal it uh, or misappropriate it from our corporations, our universities, our research labs, so they can through, uh, maybe I'll get to this slide, um, uh, <clears throat> a process that they have of civil military fusion, uh, plow it back into the modernization of their military. If there's nothing else you take away from my lecture, I hope you will take away some understanding of the concept of sharp power. Sharp power can best be described by the term that the former um, Australian uh, prime minister used, uh, to um, <clears throat> uh, uh, describe what China is doing when he said its activities are covert, coercive, or corrupting, frequently all three. And that's really sharp power. It's power that's being deployed in the shadows, non-transparently, through either intimidation or social, economic, and political coercion to get the other actor to do what it wouldn't otherwise do. That's the definition of power, whether it's to transfer technology, to sign quote, cooperative agreements, um, to censor their language and criticism uh, and to endorse what China is doing and so on and so forth. So sharp power thrives in the absence of transparency and accountability. I know you're doing a lot of work on the Belt and Road Initiative, 
That is why all of the contracts, the physical infrastructure contracts for the Belt and Road Initiative are secret. And what they've done, I don't know as much about Asia, what they've done in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's really neo-colonialism on a very grand level. They signed this secret agreement with the government. Often a huge amount of money is transferred under the table to the government officials that um, are signing these contracts or forging these ties. Uh, a country signs away a good share of its mineral wealth or maybe you know, one of its ports for China to develop and build, but then control. And you know, pretty soon you've surrendered your sovereignty or a thick slice of it to a country that has ambitions for global hegemony. Um, so sharp power generates dependencies, yield, wields threats and maneuvers for control. I, I hope you will remember that. Uh, and usually it's greased or lubricated with very substantial flows of under the table money. No one sees these secret payments, but some individuals in government or in the corporate world or something like that wind up suddenly having a huge amount of wealth that they didn't previously have. Um, So um, we did a study uh, at Hoover, came out in 2018, on China's influence and American interest toward constructive vigilance. And we had to do some serious thinking about, you know, what is legitimate influence that all countries um, have the right to try and exercise? And what is influence that's improper? and that we really should, as democratic or open societies, try to be resistant. And the problem with China is that it often blends the two. So public diplomacy, soft power, the effort of um, uh, you know, government actors, diplomats and so on to, to make their case uh, and appeal to the people and promote cultural and educational exchanges, and, um, you know, send their foreign students abroad. Um, that is a, a legitimate way of, um, uh, you know, projecting power. You can't object to that. Soft power is a country's ability to persuade, attract, and inspire others through transparent activities and open debate, like the conversation I hope we'll have soon. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you talk about your mutual interests, uh, you talk about what might be possible, you make your claim about why you think your system is better than another, uh, you make your appeal about why and how your relations might evolve, but it's above board and people can um, evaluate it. Sharp power uses wealth, stealth, that's secrecy, deception, corruption, coercion, and censorship to try and get other countries to do what the wielder of sharp power wants them to do. China's influence uh, operations extend from its propaganda apparatus. Uh, now the voice of China it includes the Xinhua News Agency, the People's Daily, China Global Television and others, the Confucius Institutes that teach Chinese while promoting only positive views of China. It's trying to, you know, corner purchase movie studios, media companies, information technology companies to become vehicles of, uh, and often in very subtle ways of Chinese propaganda. Um, it's funding think tanks in the West, perhaps elsewhere, to try and steer them to a Chinese point of view. Once it has the funding in place, you know, the line is, well, you can't criticize, um, you know, we're supposed to have a friendly relationship here. So, 
any criticism you're going to utter of the PRC is going to come at the cost of your funding. Uh, and a lot of grants have been made, Europe, the US, uh, uh, elsewhere, to institutions and individuals who are studying China in a pro-China, which is to say pro-PRC, pro-Chinese Communist Party sort of way. And this puts their own students at risk as well, as I'll explain. The goal here is to disarm and discredit resistance, preempt it, demoralize it, defeat it, before it can really question or challenge what China is doing in the world. They've tried to do that to us by saying all of our efforts to question what China is doing is just racist. We hate the Chinese people. We're stimulating anti-Asian or anti-Chinese sentiment in the US. Uh, it's just bigotry. Uh, I don't accept this. We have been very outspoken about the need to guard and uphold the rights of Chinese Americans, but this is their way of trying to shut down the conversation. Another way they try and shut down the conversation is saying, oh, you're just a new cold warrior. You're trying to you know, um, start a new cold war, or maybe you want war itself, or you just want to keep China down, or you want to keep the Chinese people down. Um, this is not um, my uh, purpose or view. Um, China is going to be a great power. It's becoming a great power. It deserves to be a great power. If you look at its size, uh, its location, its civilizational traditions and so on, but it should become a great power by, uh, first of all, playing fairly uh, and transparently in world affairs, de uh, dealing with other countries, not least your own and others that border China with mutual respect. Um, and, um, not through bullying and intimidation. Controlling the narrative elsewhere in the world means censoring, preempting, intimidating any expression of criticism of China, of its behavior in Xinjiang, of its behavior in Tibet, of its behavior in Hong Kong, of its uh, suppression of human rights, uh, of its suppression of the lawyers who are trying to defend human rights, its suppression of all forms of religion. You know, you just can't talk about these things or you're anti-China. And it has a merciless uh, and very far-flung effort to monitor and intimidate its Chinese students overseas. And they are warned. And they understand if they issue criticism or even questioning of China <coughs> in the classroom and their social media abroad, um, not only are they putting their own careers at risk, but their parents and other family members could suffer severe punishment. And so if a, a Chinese overseas student in an American, European, Japanese university, whatever, they start tweeting or um, expressing themselves or showing up to a demonstration about what happened on June 4th in Tiananmen Square or what China's been doing in Hong Kong or whatever it might be. You know, uh, the police visit their parents. Uh, they warn the parents they could lose their jobs. The student will never have a future in China. The parents call up their student in tears. Why are you doing this to us? They're threatening to fire us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Don't ruin the lives of your family. It's very powerful stuff. And of course they seek to co-opt and control the Chinese language media abroad. Many Chinese newspapers, radio stations, TV stations in Australia, Chinese language uh, in, um, the US and Europe and Canada have been bought up um, by businessmen who are connected to the Chinese Communist Party and they become mouthpieces for the CCP or they're warned, you know, um, it's like the mafia coming in Italy to visit your house. Uh, if you don't want your house to burn down, 
you better play ball. Well, there's a variety of ways metaphorically to make a house play down, ruin a business, uh, or ruin a family or so on. So this is how they work. Um, their um, principal uh, aims are to shape US and global understanding of, reporting of, and engagement with China on terms that will cast the Chinese Communist Party in a very fav favorable light. As I said, to censor all criticism of China in the ways you see here, to promote friendly relations with US cities, universities, NGOs, corporations, local governments, think tanks, to mute all concern about China's geopolitical behavior, its efforts to take over mineral resources and islands in the South China Sea, to threaten uh, Taiwan and violate uh, its uh, you know, air identification zone, uh, its coastal waters, um, to use the Belt and Road Initiative to uh, compel uh, its partner countries to submit to its will and censor their views, to take their giant fishing trawlers, you don't have this problem, uh, but Vietnam, uh, lots of African countries, Latin American countries, the Philippines, you know, their, their resource bases, these are coastal countries, people depend on fisheries and it can be a very important source not only of food and protein for local populations, but of exports and income for the country. China brings these fishing trawlers straight into the coastal waters under the uh, territorial sovereignty of the country. And it's like a vacuum cleaner. They just vacuum up all the fish and there's nothing left. Anyway, you can see the remaining elements of this. Um, they're seeking to control as much data as possible, not only so they can learn more about you and me and really everybody in the world who's digitally connected, but more data means more ability to train their artificial intelligence to become one of the, uh, uh, to become the leading AI power in the world. And then I'll, I'll end with this slide. There's a lot more I have, but I wanna leave time for questions you can see the kind of vision of the Belt and Road Initiative here um, to connect uh, the world uh, from Beijing to Western Europe uh, through Central Asia and South Asia, not depicted here, but you know what's going on, and back through Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and so on. And you know the drill, um, they want control over infrastructure. It's really critically important. Ports, airports, levers of uh, control over the global economy and the flow of goods and, and choke points and so on. And you know, they, this is not a gift China is doing to build this infrastructure. It comes with loans at commercial rates of interest. They're not even concessional loans. Uh, and often the country doesn't know what the terms of the loans are because the contracts are, are not transparent. And then if you, you know, it's like the mafia, if you fall behind in your payments, uh, they come after you. And this is happening with a lot of countries in Asia and Africa, Latin America and so on. And you know the famous case of Sri Lanka, this is in your regional neighborhood. Well, they say, oh, sorry, you fell into debt so far behind on the loan we gave you to build this port. What a pity. Well, we'll tell you what, you give us a 99 year lease for your port here, we'll control it, we'll run it, it'll be ours for a century. Irony, you know, that's kind of what Britain did with Hong Kong. And we'll forgive a billion dollars of your debt. And that's kind of the game they're playing in the world. So uh, this is a very dangerous game. Uh, and you know, countries need to be aware of what they're up against. Okay, uh, so now I'll answer questions. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Larry, thank you so much for a very enlightening presentation. Uh, it was really a great learning experience. We have received lots of questions, hence, without taking much time, let me jump to the questions as we have received from different platforms. Um, let me start with, like, how has China's economic development affected freedom and human rights in China? That is one. And there are lots of questions on those periphery that is China's global power overrated than it deserves? Uh, there are lots of questions within this periphery on economic, like how China is using its economic might uh, in affecting the democracy around the world. So you're asking how China's economic modernization has affected freedom in China? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, initially, we had hopes. I do believe that there is something called modernization theory. It's not perfect. It's not inevitable. It's not a straight line. But um, I, I think maybe you've seen a little bit of this in your own country as people become more educated, as people become more connected. They do want more voice and more ability to determine their own affairs. They get the intellectual resources and the information to be more questioning. Um, they want to be treated with more dignity. Self-determination for themselves and their country becomes more important. It may be, and often I think eventually evolves into a demand for democracy itself or deepening of democracy, reform of democracy. But at least, at least it moves in the direction of people wanting more openness, more liberty, more uh, participation, more political accountability, more fairness, uh, more voice. It looked like that was happening, particularly under Zhang, Zhang Zemin, <clears throat> you know, uh, in the 1990s, early 2000s. I had some experience of my own uh, where I saw some hopeful signs. You know, during the mid to late 1990s, China was embarked on a process of village elections, competitive village elections. And I, in March of 1998, I went there, I observed it. They weren't fully democratic. There were no opposition parties, but, you know, at the local level, people could voice criticism and throw out bad leaders, and then that generates a kind of model. But as I said, this all became very threatening. And so what um, Xi Jinping did when he came to power <clears throat> in 2012 is reassert not only political control and information control, so much <clears throat> tighter control of what people could do, but also much, much more comprehensive censorship of the media, even kind of uh, magazines that were, you know, read by only limited numbers of people, certainly social media. And he ramped up ideological propaganda. So now, um, young people in college uh, and high school are hit with this uh, uh, extremely uh, imposing uh, effusion of Xi Jinping thought. No one can really concisely explain what the heck Xi Jinping thought is. I think it's a kind of disarticulated jumble of, um, propositions that basically, uh, you know, elevate uh, Chinese Communist Party dominance and unquestioning obedience to the party in the state. <clears throat> but um, the effect of modernization theory was interrupted. Uh, and it is capable of being interrupted, at least for a time, by the imposition of um, party and state control. Uh, but this comes at some very high prices. One price is um, 
uh, not only of human rights and freedom, of course, but even of economic rationale. Let's just give you one example. Um, one of the big threats that modernization poses to uh, authoritarian and particularly neo-totalitarian rule is that it creates uh, a class of business people, of entrepreneurs, who can challenge uh, the power of the party state. And these entrepreneurs in China represent, have represented a big threat to the Chinese Communist Party. So they've been cracked down upon. Many of them have been thrown in jail. They get prosecuted, their assets are seized. Well, who wants to stay in a China where, uh, you know, that is the risk you're facing of losing everything you built, losing your freedom. You know, so there's, there, many of them are fleeing abroad. Most of them are sending their kids abroad. They don't want to live in that kind of system. So uh, I think China is going to suffer a lot of lost potential for economic development because of this. Uh, we can move to other question. Uh, you just mentioned about Belt and Road Initiative. So what effects does China's Belt and Road Initiative have on international freedom, especially in countries that take part in this initiative? That is one. And second is that how does China's approach to governance and human rights impact its relation with countries in terms of promoting or inhabiting global freedom? Like, for example, how does China's poor record on human rights impact its relation with the US, which is a democracy? So um, it would be too simplistic um, to say, you know, if you sign up for the Belt and Road Initiative, you're signing away your freedom. Um, but I do think, you know, we've been, I'm not giving you my democracy lecture. I have a democracy lecture too, uh, that explores, that shows that we've been in about a 16 year long democratic recession with freedom and democracy on balance moving backwards in the world. You can see what's been happening in India um, in certain other part in Bangladesh and other parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, uh, much of Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, in, I'm not going to say the Belt and Road Initiative has had anything to do with um, the regression of freedom and democracy under the BJP and Prime Minister Modi in India, but in weaker states, um, it has had a negative role because it's been promoting corruption and um, it has been undermining good governance, judicial independence parliamentary oversight, independent institutions, and um, creating, uh, number one, or reinforcing an ethic that you don't need transparency, secret contracts are okay, and uh, number two, subverting institutions, the autonomy and integrity of important societal institutions, universities, research institutes, local government corporations, whatever it might be. So um, as many of these countries have drawn closer uh, to China and taken the kind of poison chalice of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, it's often been associated with the deterioration of freedom, media freedom, uh, and the quality of governance. Uh, in terms of government integrity and transparency. And, you know, my message to uh, other countries of the world uh, that frankly need infrastructure and have a right to seek international resources to build it and advance it is not, don't, you know, have any relationship with China. Um, it's just uh, defend your rights and your own national interests and don't sell out for uh, 
you know, a short term attractive, but ultimately illusory uh, type of benefit. So I think, um, you know, some of the principles that countries should bring to bear on negotiations with the Belt and Road Initiative for the construction of infrastructure should be number one, an insistence on absolute transparency. Any agreement reached should um, be available for review and inspection by the parliament of the country, media of the country and the people of the country. <laughs> You can't justify our country. Who um, I, I think that there needs to be an independent assessment by economists and so on, which of course you can't do uh, if it's not transparent of whether it makes sense for the country. So you know, if China wants to help your country, Ghana, Brazil, whatever. Uh, then you know should it be lending at um a commercial rate and what are the terms of repayment is the investment going to revenue investment of economic that's going to enable the rep at interest rate and over the time period I think we lost connection. Sir, please unmute yourself. We briefly lost the connection. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not going to say that you know China is the only bad actor here. It's not, and certainly historically, uh, there's a lot we could condemn with respect to Europe, the United States, and so on. But the point is, you know, the famous. Latin phrase, caveat emptor, buyer beware. And so, um, you know, each country has to go into these relationships with some insistence on transparency, some insistence on equality and reciprocity in the relationship, and some ability to independently evaluate whether what's being negotiated makes good sense for the country. Otherwise, you're gonna see a negative effect on development, negative effect on freedom, negative effect on the quality of governance. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're running out of time. So let me take one last question. Like what are the potential long-term consequences for global freedom if China continues to strengthen its economic and political right on the interests of the state. And similarly, what role can civil society, human rights organizations, and individuals play in promoting global freedom in the face of China's rise as a global power? Good. So um, first, let me speak about the long term. Then let me speak about civil society uh, in countries say of uh, the recipient countries, Global South and so on. Um, you know, I am uh, an optimist. Uh, my first trip to Nepal, I think was, uh, well, first trip was in the 80s, but then my first trip to engage the kinds of people who are on this Zoom call 
was in 1991. And <coughs> I've always been hopeful and optimistic uh, that Nepal, Nepal could find its way to uh, stable, uh, you know, and gradually improving democracy. And I think almost every country can do so. I believe in modernization theory. I've seen from uh, the public opinion and value data. I'm a member of the uh, Asian barometer team that uh, attitudes and values change uh, with modernization. We, our China data was showing that before the Xi Jinping <coughs> ideological crackdown. So in the long run, I'm hopeful. I believe China is going to change. And that um, this in the long run is not sustainable because um, it's not what the Chinese people want. And as in order to create a successful and globally leading country, the Communist Party authorities cannot keep the Chinese people in a bubble. They're going to have to enable them to engage worldwide see the world, understand how other people live, get access to other sources of information. And when that happens, people are gonna want change. Um, but the problem you know, is in a transitional period. It could be a long transitional period. It could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, it could be more when China's power is rising but the party is still able to hang on or reassert again neo-totalitarian control and so i would say countries need to defend themselves and defend their rights and the rights of their people now part of it is i mean that quite literally china's military is expanding at a frightening pace and the countries around its periphery from uh, India and uh, I would say Nepal and others uh, to Vietnam certainly has felt this very acutely. Uh, the Philippines, Japan, Taiwan, and so on, you know, they need to have capacity to defend themselves. Um, but most of all, I think civil society does have a very important role to play in uh, two respects. First of all, in strengthening your capacity uh, to understand how sharp power works, understand how China is, uh, operates, and to ensure that your relations with the PRC, particularly if you're taking any money, which I would basically not recommend, um, but you know, if you have exchanges and relationships and so on, that everything's transparent uh, and you're wary. Um, the watchword we issued was not isolate yourselves from China. Um, it was constructive vigilance. And the three elements of constructive vigilance that we recommended in our report, which is on our website at the uh, Hoover Institution, <clears throat> uh, our report on China's influence in American interest, if um, can you see this? No. no. Share screen one more time, just for one more slide before we close. You see uh, how to respond. The best way uh, to address these challenges is through constructive vigilance, uh, grounded in three core principles, transparency in relations, contracts, all of that preserving and building up the integrity of our institutions, and including that means institutional integrity, your ability to monitor and, um, uh, you know, know what the relationship be, involves and to enhance your capacity to understand, learn from ex comparative experiences and so on. And reciprocity, um, you know, well, if they want to come to you, you should be able to go to them too. And there should be some equality in the sharing of information and the ability to voice your concerns. It, it should be a dialogue and not a monologue. 
So um, I think those are the ways that civil society can actually play a very important role in monitoring and capacity building and so on to ensure that relations with China are, are balanced and consistent with the national interest. Uh, Professor Larry, it was really an interesting discussion. We still have more than 30 questions, but we are running out of time and we have to end it here. We are really sorry uh, that we could not take all the questions. It was really an honor to have you with us. And thank you so much for spending your valuable time. We hope to have you in person in Nepal, maybe in future. Thank you so much. Over to you. Okay. Mike. Thank you. Good luck to all of you. Uh, have a nice evening and um, stay healthy and safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of, hi. On behalf of um, Nice, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Larry Diamond for his time and for helping us expand our vantage point of China and its implications for um, global freedom, as well as the audience's active engagement and contribution to exchanging ideas. Uh, let us embrace this opportunity to promote further dialogue, foster mutual understanding, and work towards a world that upholds our shared values. Uh, thank you for joining us on this momentous occasion, and we hope you can attend our future meetings, events as well, learn more about us and our future events through our website, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and almost all social media platforms, all under the handle of NICE, N-I-I-C-E, Nepal. Have a wonderful day or night, depending on where you live. Thank you.